was the best mafia captain on The Sopranos? Today, we delve deep into the heart of New Jersey's underworld to dissect the leadership, cunning, and sheer brutality of the 13 capos who held sway throughout the series. Throughout our journey, we'll analyze each capo's strengths and weaknesses to determine who truly reigned supreme. And as we reach our conclusion, we'll unravel the mystery behind why some didn't quite make the cut. First off, Jimmy's notable downfall begins when he's flipped by the FBI after a poorly timed arrest at an executive card game. But what really speeds up his discovery by the authorities? It's his own behavior. So what happened? Long story, you got some place in private we could talk? Yeah, in the basement. His constant probing and questions directed at Tony Soprano raise enough suspicion to put him on thin ice. What are you gonna do about the Colombian money? Adding another layer to this complex situation, there's confusion surrounding Tony's suspicion that Sal might also be an informant. Despite the uncertainty, Jimmy's actions remain dubious enough to alarm Junior Soprano, leading to a dire outcome. You're right, it's him. All of a sudden, it's for me to discuss shit we already covered. Silvio and Christopher execute the hit on Jimmy in a hotel room, mockingly urging him to use the wire he's wearing to call for help. Why don't you call for help in your radio mic? Rat. Oh, God. Reflecting on Jimmy's brief tenure as a capo, we see a lack of substantial mafia activity. Beyond dining with the crew and mentioning collections, his role doesn't dive deeper into the gritty responsibilities that define a true capo. I still worry about the money end. It's because that's what you do, you worry. His story ends abruptly. He talks with Tony, gets raided by the feds. Oh my goodness. Do you know what this is? It's a and is ultimately whacked, never to be mentioned again. F ass piece of shit. Feech LaManna, originally a zip, quickly climbed the ranks in the North Jersey criminal world, eventually earning respect as revered captain. The man, the legend, Feech LaManna. Hey, my God, look at you. After being paroled in 2004, having served time since the late 80s, Feech attempted to reassert his influence, leveraging his strong presence and deep understanding of Mafia traditions. I'd like to get back in the game. But the question arises, was he effective in the modern mob landscape? On one hand, Feech's old school tactics and tough demeanor commanded respect. I said, you heard me, motherfucker. What the fuck are you looking at? He was quick to reestablish his influence upon his release, navigating the community with his old ties. Jesus, you're on your feet already? You hit the ground running, and you don't look back, huh? However, Feech often struggled with the evolving dynamics of the Soprano family under Tony's reign. Oh, well, you don't step on anybody's toes. Me? I'm Fred Astaire. Feech's struggle to adapt became evident during various incidents. For instance, when he and Tony Blundetto were released, Feech seemed out of touch with current schemes, such as the airbag theft operation showing his detachment from the new criminal enterprises that had developed during his 20 years in the can. Brave new world, Jesus Christ. Moreover, Feech's violent nature came to the forefront during an altercation with Sal Vitro, where he brutally assaulted Sal, demonstrating an inability to restrain his old habits of using muscle over mind. Oh, f off, huh? I'm busy here. <laughs> this impulsiveness caused further friction within the family, especially with Polly leading to conflicts over territorial control, which Tony had to diplomatically resolve. Which entitles you to shit. In my book, you get points for staying out of the can. Despite Feech's initial effectiveness as a captain, his inability to align with the current mafia leadership and his failure to adapt to new methods ultimately led to his downfall. You want me to show you what this war Yeah. Who would you say is the best mafia captain in the Sopranos universe? It's a question that stirs up a lot of debate among fans, especially when you consider the complexities of characters like Ray Curdo. Tony Soprano and Vito Spadafore talking about the bus station project. His role may not seem immediately interesting, but when we delve deeper into his connection with Tony and the feds, a richer picture emerges. What can we say about this guy? The ancient Romans had a word for it. Asshole. <laughs> Remember when Tony exclaimed, Can I ever catch a break? Ironically, the very next scene showed Curdo's demise while with the FBI, immediately after he delivered a low-quality tape where he claimed he could testify against Tony. Sound quality's not good, but I can back it up in court. This tape surprisingly turned out to be a significant break for Tony. How so? 
It potentially helped him avoid the kind of quick Rico indictment that Johnny Sack faced almost immediately after becoming boss. But what about Ray's day-to-day -day operations? Despite being an elderly man, he still had responsibilities like making collections and managing his crew, although we rarely saw his underlings on screen. In the season two opener, for instance, Ray hands Tony a large envelope of cash, a task he surely didn't handle solo. This suggests he had a capable crew handling most of the street-level work while he focused on gathering intel and appearing at key meetings. Moreover, Ray's personal circumstances, such as caring for a child with multiple sclerosis, likely influenced him to step back from the front line of the family business, delegating more actively to his crew. I also got an 18-year-old with MS, okay? I told Nucci I'd be doing less, not more. This strategic withdrawal didn't diminish his importance. If anything, it reaffirmed his status within the organization. Promoted to capo years earlier, Ray was primarily responsible to the upper echelons of the mob hierarchy, an arrangement that highlights both his strategic value and his dangerous double life as an informant. Stand up guys like that, they're a dying breed. I'm into that. Let's dive into Richie April's tumultuous comeback and see how he measures up. Richie burst back onto the scene after a stint in prison, immediately making waves with his old school brutality. Remember when he ran over Beansy and flat out refused to cover the medical bills? Up of the ramp up to your ass. Drive a Lionel up in there. That's Richie for you. Ruthless to the core. But was his approach effective? Well, he demanded profits for the time he spent in jail, ignoring the fact he hadn't contributed to the business lately. <laughs> Richie struggled to adapt to the changes within the organization and even hatched a doomed plan to overthrow Tony. Yeah, well, some people are stuffing themselves. Some people are out there stuffing themselves. Only Larry's got a trial coming up. He's in no position to go into the unknown, not known. His plan backfired spectacularly, leading to his end at the hands of his own fiance, Janice. Imagine that. Janice, with her love for the finer things in life, might have driven Richie to financial ruin if she hadn't pulled the trigger first. Let's not forget. Richie did try to hit the ground running after his release. He aggressively pursued Beansy for old debts and dragged Davey into financial trouble. You got some f***ing balls, you know that? I do. I should stab you in the f***ing eye. Turning to drug dealing, he sought quick profits as traditional revenue streams like garbage collection weren't cutting it. Yet, he couldn't smoothly take over his and his late brother Jackie's operations, which needed time and tactful management. Something Richie lacked. I've been in line for 10 f***ing Years. My uncle's just asking for what my father would have given him if he was boss when Richie got out of prison. His personal life? A mess. Janice pressured him into splurging on a lavish wedding and a big house, complicating his comeback even more. Without Janice's deadly intervention, Richie's financial situation could have spiraled down like Davies did. Richie also had a severe Napoleon complex. He was always out to prove his toughness, often through violence and intimidation. This need to assert his strength stemmed from deep insecurities about his stature, but it only highlighted his inadequacies. It's the jacket! Jacket, 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 jacket. Let's consider Christopher's journey, which is fueled by ambition and his father's legacy. However, he often finds himself torn between his criminal life and a dream of becoming a filmmaker. Louis Brazzi sleeps with the fishes. Luca Brazzi. Luca. Whatever. This begs the question. How effectively can someone juggle personal aspirations with the demanding life of a mobster? Christopher's record as a mobster is quite mixed. His impulsiveness and addiction issues often jeopardize his reliability and decision-making. I f you. Excuse me? You fucking heard me. These personal struggles lead to numerous professional setbacks, including endangering fellow wise guys and inadvertently leaking sensitive information. Oh yeah? Despite these flaws, Christopher does show signs of loyalty and leadership potential. Tony Soprano, recognizing these qualities, promotes him to a captain, partly out of familial loyalty and partly as a strategic move to prepare him as a potential successor. In 2005, Christopher founded the Multisanti crew, with members including his closest friends and trusted men, Benny Fazio and James Zancone. The crew was commonly used for physical tasks, such as interrogation and threatening, thanks to their young, strong members. They were also in charge of handling two hitmen from the Naples Camorra. A friend over there is going to fit him for a soup. She's sending over two of her best tailors. Using their Italian fluent associate Corky Caporal for the hit on Rusty Milio. Eastern Parkway, not the Belt Parkway. 
During 2006 and 2007, Christopher and his crew produced the mafia slasher movie Cleaver, which was a success. People are seeing huge profits with these digital horror movies. Douchebags who never made a film before. However, Christopher started to grow anger and resentment toward Tony. Frustrated by not receiving as many money-making businesses as the other capos and constantly being chastised and mocked for his abstinence from alcohol. But you will respect me. After an incident with Pauly, Christopher descends back into drug addiction. He sent his idiot nephew and Jason Molinara to my father-in-law's store. They boosted a pallet of power saws. They did? Yeah and was later suffocated to death by Tony after a car accident while high on coke. I'll never pass a drug test. The rest of the crew was then merged back into the Gualtieri crew shortly thereafter, though most of Chrissy's crew had lost their respect for Tony. If I were a carpenter and you were a douchebag. Gigi really stands out, doesn't he? People often remember him fondly, and it's not just us, the fans. Characters within the show seem to echo this sentiment, often acknowledging his qualities even when discussing his suitability as Capo. Despite being a character introduced as a potential leader, Gigi's tenure was marked by an incredibly dramatic exit. Remember that shocking scene? What the f at? Call 911. He died in a rather compromising situation, during a bathroom break at the Bing, combining stress relief in the most unfortunate way. His untimely death left many viewers wishing he could have stayed on the show a bit longer, perhaps in a role with less pressure and more downtime. It feels like his character was primarily used to thwart Ralph's ambition, making Gigi a pivotal, albeit brief, plot device in the series. Whatever you say, Cappy. Thinking about the various capos in the show, if you had to work under one, wouldn't Gigi be an interesting choice? <laughs> Gigi, are you shitting me? I'm sorry. Despite his short screen time, he was depicted as both capable and staunchly loyal. A clear reason why Tony preferred him over Ralphie for the capo position. What do you think? Could he have been the best capo if circumstances had allowed? What's wrong with you? We're trying to have a meeting here. Oh, two minutes he's in charge. He's fucking a coca. When thinking about the best mafia captain in the Sopranos universe, Bobby often doesn't immediately come to mind, does he? After all, his track record for violent actions is minimal. He is known for just one hit throughout the series. But isn't it intriguing how his low kill count and different approach might actually make him one of the most effective and badass characters? You know, Quasimodo predicted all this. Bobby's uniqueness shines through in his restraint from unnecessary violence. Even his single hit, carried out while he was on vacation, was executed flawlessly. He might not be the smartest, but he compensates with courage and a strong moral compass, standing up fiercely for what he believes in. Whether it's confronting Junior over a casual remark or facing down anyone who dares to cross him, Bobby stands his ground. If you don't go to these anger classes they have or whatever, this with us ain't gonna work out. His promotion in 2002 to captain of Junior Soprano's crew was a significant milestone although marred by personal tragedy with the loss of his wife, Karen, the same year. This took a toll on his mental health, but eventually he bounced back, maintaining his responsibilities even as he navigated his grief. His relationship with Tony Soprano's sister, Janice, led to him becoming closer to Tony, eventually earning him a spot in Tony's inner circle. He's gonna fix it so we do all the window replacements in the projects. I was thinking maybe you should work that. The conflict over the Roseville sports book in 2006 further showcased his leadership. He should have never had it to begin with except for the beef with the Tasty Freeze rule. Junior ruled on it and it wasn't right then. Despite initial disputes with then-Captain Vito Spadafore, Bobby held firm on his claim, a testament to his understanding of territorial rights and mob politics. His elevation to underboss in 2007, followed by acquiring lucrative ventures like window replacement contracts and a medication pill operation, underscored his capability to handle bigger responsibilities within the family. Redneck <laughs> my baby was on that ride, my wife. Carlo Gervasi often pops up when fans discuss the best mafia captain in the Sopranos universe. Today, we'll take a closer look at Carlo's capabilities and whether he truly deserves the top spot. Carlo's leadership journey began with a bang in 1999, following the murder of Jimmy Altieri, when he took charge of the Altieri crew. 
Under his command, the crew flourished, particularly in controlling the New Jersey ports. This success begs the question, does excelling in one area qualify someone as the best overall? In 2006, Carlo encountered a fresh challenge when he assumed leadership of Vito Spadafore's crew after Vito was ousted. This new role, although promising, proved difficult for Carlo as he struggled to generate significant revenue, which disappointed the higher-ups. Maybe you should start sucking cock instead of watching TV land, because Vito bought in three times what you do on construction. Discussing loyalty and trust, Carlo's record is a mixed bag. For the majority of the series, he appears loyal to Tony Soprano and functions effectively within the family's hierarchy. However, things took a drastic turn in 2007 when Carlo's son, Jason Gervasi, got arrested on drug charges. What if he flipped? Who? Carlo? Well... Facing his son's legal troubles, Carlo made the drastic decision to cooperate with authorities and testify against Tony Soprano. So Carlo has flipped. We don't know. The subpoenas are flying. This begs another important question. Can someone who flips under pressure still be considered a top capo? You talk to Mink again? It's Carlo. He's gonna testify. On the strategic side, Carlo initially shows competent judgment in handling operations. However, his ability to anticipate and manage significant threats to his position and the family's overall safety seems questionable. His final actions may reflect either desperation or a failure to secure his and his family's power within the mafia hierarchy. Let's take a closer look at Polly Walnuts. First off, did you know that Polly, along with Junior, are the only members of the DeMio crime family who never got married? It's interesting to consider whether this is due to their total commitment to mob life or just a mere coincidence. Either way, it highlights their dedication. Polly is not just notorious for his high kill count, his real prowess shows in how he handles money. Whoops. Polly. He's got a real knack for squeezing every penny out of his operations, which is crucial in the Mafia's cutthroat economic environment. Remember how he dealt with Christopher? That's a perfect example of his relentless approach to collections. I'm gonna give you a couple extra days, but it's gonna cost you another two Gs as a reminder not to f it up. But what really sets Polly apart is his surprising ability to avoid physical harm. While many of his colleagues suffer violent fates, Polly navigates through life with minimal damage. Sure, he had a brief stint in jail, but in the grand scheme of things, that's nothing compared to the fates of many around him. Even amid feuds with other mobsters like Christopher, Feech, or Ralph, Clarence manages to keep things under control. Oh, what do you know about who belongs to what? You've been away 20 years. His ability to handle the treacherous politics within the mob is truly impressive. <laughs> it's this cunning that makes a strong case for him being one of the best capos. When Tony Soprano handed over control of his crew to Polly, he took charge of all the old businesses. From extorting drug dealers and running scams to managing legitimate fronts like Baroni Sanitation and Masserone Construction, Polly showed he could handle a vast array of operations. You know, I'm, I'm starting to feel a little intimidated. As well you should, my friend. Despite a downturn in season four by season five, his crew was back on top, earning big again. But it's not just about the money. Polly's seniority in the mob, his role as an enforcer, and his undying loyalty to the Mafia also play into his favor. I remember getting one just like it, me and all my friends. Going to be a tough guy, just like him. <laughs> Though he may not be the brightest or the most likable, and while he occasionally slips... I gotta take a wicked shit. Can you stop interrupting me? His connection to the mob's glory days and his toughness in confrontations cannot be overlooked. Sir, what is this? Nitroglycerin, what do you think? Cologne, smell it, you don't believe me. Proceed. So, is Polly the best capo in the Sopranos universe? He's certainly far from the worst choice and in many ways represents a bridge to the old ways of the mafia. Tough, loyal, and unwavering. What do you hear? What do you say? <laughs> Was Vito truly a good capo? During a critical period when Tony Soprano was hospitalized, Vito didn't waste any time. He began rallying support from other capos, eyeing the leadership position for himself should Tony not recover. Tony goes, let's face it, somebody's gonna have to step into the breach. This move into the spotlight raised questions about his potential to lead. But it's not just his ambition that colored his time as a capo. Captain, the good ship Lollipop, right? His actions were also marked by significant darkness. 
For instance, Vito's decision to kill a citizen after a car accident to dodge police involvement showed his ruthless side, revealing how far he would go to protect his status. Yet one of the most compelling elements of Vito's narrative was his dark secret. Spatafor was a master at greasing the unions. When he was always talking about greasing the union, who knew that's what he meant? <laughs> it's a f joke. Right. Sure. Aside from his personal life, Vito was notably cunning in his professional dealings. He seemed to have a strategy for manipulating people through their vices. Observant fans might recall Vito's presence at poker games, often losing but somehow never significantly harming his financial standing. I bet this was part of his larger plan to ensnare mid-ranking citizens. By losing to these men, Vito made them indebted to him, allowing for manipulation, especially if they were degenerate gamblers, as Vito once described a new developer. A lot of money in his shit. Oh yeah? Vito's involvement in the construction industry also showcased his skills. Unlike some of his peers who merely profited from the mob's corrupt dealings in construction, Vito had genuine experience. He was hands-on in projects like building a ramp for Beansy and had previously worked in electrical tasks, showing his practical knowledge. The hell's this? A siesta? What? I wasn't sleeping. Let's talk about Larry Burris. He might not be the first name that comes to mind, but he's definitely in the running. Larry, sometimes called Lorenzo, is a standout character, known for his affable and laid-back demeanor. Okay, I'm no good at speeches. Yeah, you almost time you'll hear some great speeches. <laughs> Unlike some of the more volatile members of the Soprano family, Larry doesn't lose his temper or harm others physically, and he's even got a sense of humor, often cracking jokes with fellow mobsters. Asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but let's dive into his mob credentials. Larry was influential during the 90s and played a significant role after the death of acting boss Jackie April Sr., when it came time to choose a new leader, Larry was a key voice. And God bless your uncle. But he's living in the wrong century. And New York knows it. He nominated Tony Soprano as a potential boss and later supported Tony's strategic use of Junior Soprano as the official boss, while Tony ran things behind the scenes. Yeah, and now you got Bloomfield and the union chair. <laughs> this move showed Larry's political savvy and his understanding of the power dynamics within the family. Larry's effectiveness is also evident in how he managed his crew and his operations. His crew, one of the most profitable, focused on loan sharking and illegal gambling. This financial success made him a key player. Even when faced with challenges like Junior's misuse of power, Larry stood up for his crew's interests, ensuring their profitability was not compromised. A certain friend of ours should have checked with me before he did a favor for the old man Capri. Despite facing indictments and even spending time under house arrest, Larry remained in control of his crew, a feat not many capos managed to maintain. Hey, how you doing, my friend? You getting enough to eat? Brian Raleigh, U.S. Marshals Service. Albert stepped in as the acting capo of the Burris crew when his cousin, Larry Burris, was jailed on racketeering charges. Known for his unique speech habit, repeating what others say. All right, who gave the order to torch one of Albert's trucks? One of the trucks. Be quiet, Albert. Albert's role has intrigued fans and characters alike. So why did Albert consistently echo others' words? Imagine getting a facelift one week later you're in jail. Can you imagine that? You get a facelift one week later you're in jail? Known affectionately as a parakeet by his peers, that parakeet. Albert might have been dealing with echolalia, a condition that leads to repetitive speech. We're off the record here, Albert. We're off the record. However, this quirk possibly served as a clever defense mechanism. Go talk to Ali boy. Feel him out. But he's a slippery f Imagine the advantage in a world where any word can incriminate you. Repeating what's said gives nothing away. It's a brilliant, non-committal approach to tricky mafia conversations, isn't it? Albert's loyalty and strategic thinking were evident when Richie April, looking to overthrow Tony Soprano, sought his support. Make a move against Tony Soprano? No way. I don't know what to tell you. Albert declined to back Richie, a move that played a significant role in protecting Tony. When Junior Soprano learned about Richie's failed attempt to win Albert over, he chose to side with Tony, tipping him off about Richie's intentions. It's intriguing how Albert's decision had such a ripple effect, right? Furthermore, Albert showed his worth during conflicts within the family. He was embroiled in a garbage war with Ralph, another test of his leadership. This conflict drew unwanted attention, 
prompting Tony to intervene and demand no more fires. No more fires. Albert was also present during critical moments like the attempted robbery at Eugene Ponacorvo's card game, proving his ability to handle tense situations. Interestingly, despite his odd speech habit, Albert was a top earner for the family, even outperforming others while his cousin was incarcerated. His financial contribution did not go unnoticed, earning him praise from Silvio Dante. You have any idea what Albert kicked up last week? Known for being one of the most volatile figures, Ralph's rise to the position of capo was both unexpected and inevitable. You want a captain? You're captain. Thank you, Tony. You're right. When Elvis unexpectedly passed away, Tony Soprano was forced to promote Ralph to lead the April crew, despite his hesitations. On paper, Ralph's credentials are quite impressive. He's a top earner and has contributed significantly to the family's finances. But what about his behavior? Oh, family's nuts. Oh, hey, Tony. Hey! Ralph is notoriously unpredictable and erratic, which constantly keeps everyone around him on edge. Tomorrow I can be on time, but you'll be stupid forever. Hey, hey, sit down! Let's not overlook the dark side of his record. Remember the shocking incident where he murdered his pregnant girlfriend right outside of the Bing? Such a horrifying act alone is enough to raise serious concerns. It's my fault she's a klutz! But Ralph's indiscretions didn't end there. He also mocked Ginny Sachs' weight. I hear Ginny Sachs getting a 95 pound mold taken off her ass. <laughs> An action that almost ignited a full blown war between the New York and New Jersey families. I want you to sanction the hit on Ralph Zifferano. What? Are you f kidding me? Furthermore, his influence on Jackie April Jr., leading him into crime despite his family's wishes highlights Ralph's dangerous nature. Your father and Tony was on a fast track to being made, and I was still a little shittier like the two of you. Despite these significant issues, it's hard to ignore Ralph's uncanny ability to make money. Even during personal turmoil, like his son Justin's critical hospitalization, Ralph's financial prowess remained unshaken. Oh, from the thing. I could have waited. I had to smack the guy around this morning. His management of the lucrative Esplanade construction project, although marred by suspicions of skimming profits, showcases his acumen in generating revenue. This f house more creative than Spielberg. It's intriguing to note how Ralph managed to survive grave missteps, like insulting a boss's wife, primarily because he was a valuable earner. We depend on this guy. There are millions of dollars at stake. We can't afford it, John. Carmine Lupertazzi himself was willing to overlook some misdeeds and even defend Ralph. My answer has got to be no. Suggesting to Tony that to keep the business stable, it was even necessary to eliminate Johnny Sack. You saying what I think you're saying? I didn't say nothing. If you're as intrigued as we are by the blurred lines between fiction and reality in the mob world, then you won't want to miss our full video on the Sopranos actors turned criminals in real life. Hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay wise and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching.